Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, taking part here in our uh, first of hopefully a series of updates on what's going on. Uh, given the, um, the quarantine and shutdowns, we thought this would be a good venue to be able to communicate with everybody, keep everyone up to date and inform them what's going on. Um, of course, uh, here at Canaccord, we are still operating and we'll continue to do so uh, through through any shutdown periods. Uh, we, as an industry, uh, have been remote access for many, many years. And in fact, we have very resilient um, off-site operations that came into effect, especially after 2001, and still uh, remain up to date and the technologies uh, working perfectly even through this type of event that we're seeing today. So as we get started, uh, I apologize, this is new technology for me. And uh, many of you who have seen me present in the past, I am a French background and I'm used to talking in my hands and seeing people. So this is a little different. So I'll try to, uh, to keep you entertained and uh, informed as we go through here. Uh, before we get started, just some housekeeping uh, for questions. Uh, we do have all the mics muted uh, on your end. So you don't have to worry about if you're uh, at your desk or your dog or pet is in the background, or in my case, my children are in the background. Um, we won't hear any of that. Uh, we will be doing questions uh, mostly at the end, but I will keep an eye out if there's things that come up through that need to be addressed. Uh, and you can easily uh, type your questions. You should have a toolbar on your screen. Uh, I apologize, the, the one I'm showing you here is slightly different than yours because uh, this is from um, the uh, presenters mode, but in yours, you should see a little tab on the right there that says questions. And if you click on that, there'll be a little text box that opens up and you can um, just take your questions and send it. I'll be able to see them uh, and be able to uh, answer them as we go along, or as I said, uh, at the end, if they're more broad based. So that's just as far as questions go. Uh, and uh, by all means, uh, as you, most of you know me, I'm fairly informal with these things, uh, any questions you might have. So today we're going to talk about uh, what's going on in the world. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Michael LeBlanc. I'm a director and senior portfolio manager at Canaccord in Vancouver, uh, and I help uh, run portfolios for individuals and corporations uh, building their wealth. So we're going to talk a bit about a few different topics. First of all, what's going on with this COVID-19 and how it's impacting the world, more specifically the investment markets. Uh, we'll talk about what's going on in the markets currently and then also where we see opportunities and how to, to uh, capitalize on those things within portfolios. So COVID, uh, as I've always said in my messaging, uh, the markets generally do not like uncertainty. And what COVID has brought is a lot of uncertainty. Uh, not just to the financial markets, but to uh, the population in general, which has caused a range of uh, reactions. Everything from we're seeing in some areas where people are just living life normally, uh, as we saw in Florida, maybe be going a bit overboard. Um, even here in Vancouver, I've seen a lot of the parks being uh, packed uh, with individuals uh, socializing, hanging out, playing sports. Um, not really doing the social uh, distancing. Uh, to the other end, where we're seeing grocery stores being sold out and the panic side of things. Um, markets don't like that uncertainty either, just as much individuals don't like uncertainty in their lives. Uh, so the number one thing we have to, the markets have to see is uh, where this is gonna end. Like, how many people are gonna be affected? What type of controls are in place? And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Um, and right now, um, just as by, by way of qualifier, uh, we're seeing uh, an extreme from different places uh, from like Italy to uh, South Korea, so uh, a broad range. Uh, fiscal and monetary clarity. So governments around the world are stepping up their uh, fiscal and monetary stimulus to try to offset the economic impact of COVID. Uh, we're definitely, uh, in the U.S., we've already seen a couple of interest rate cuts. Uh, there's new bills in front of Congress right now uh, to add even more um, stimulus into the, uh, into the economy, including uh, one-time payments, uh, low interest rate tax exemptions, and so forth. Canada, we're seeing the same thing. 
uh, new powers being given to um, the government to make changes to taxation. We've already seen a few. Uh, of course, our tax deadline has moved, moved to June 1st. Uh, the government has reduced the um, minimum uh, RIF payments for uh, 2020 uh, by about 25%. So people don't have to take out as much from their savings if they don't need to. Uh, and uh, we can expect more along the way. But the, the markets are certainly waiting to see more clarity around what different actions we're going to see from our governments, but also the governments around the world, uh, as we're seeing in the UK and, and the EU, uh, acting on these things as well. And of course, the vaccine, a lot of talk about vaccine. Uh, and I, th there's two things we hear a lot about, uh, and I do, tell, uh, do recommend everyone and try to look at reliable sources because uh, part of our job here is to stay on top of what's going on and there is a lot of opinion uh, out there as opposed to necessarily facts and uh, uh, so when we talk about vaccine that's a vaccine uh, much like you would see in your, your, your flu vaccine although this virus is a different type so the vaccine is slightly more complicated um, I won't get into I'm not a medical profession I've just been reading uh, but uh, because of the the, the um, coronavirus, so you see that picture in the news all the time with the corona around it, it is harder for the vaccines or for the antibodies in our in our bodies to attack it. So it needs a different approach. So the experts are saying 12 to 18 months, and then we're also looking at different uh, companies are looking at cures or treatments, uh, and those ones are a bit further ahead. Uh, simply because um, the re they're trying to look at repurposing current uh, medications that were in markets uh, or developed for previous versions of corona um, or similar type of viruses. So those are two things that uh, are actively being worked on. And uh, any improvements in any of these areas, of course, will help what we're seeing in the markets because the market wants to see a bit of clarity. Uh, what we're also looking at is uh, for uh, the, the markets is a stem, uh, really to stem the tide of infections. What you're looking at here is the graphs of the different countries. Uh, the, the big one being China, of course, the first one to enter into this uh, and come out of it. And, and what we mean by coming out of it is uh, zero new cases reported in a 24 hour period. Uh, they're essentially, uh, people are recovering from it uh, much faster than people are getting it at this point. So the number of infected are on the decline. Um, we've seen other countries skirt this graph. Uh, China, of course, is finished or, or near the end as far as uh, that goes. South Korea, Singapore, Japan have all um, flattened the curve is the term that's being used. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when it, as it relates to Canada and the U.S., um, so there is there is some countries that seem to have been able to keep the infections under control, and other cases uh, we're seeing the graphs uh, spike, and we'll we'll talk about that. I will say uh, when you're looking at some of the data on here, uh, of course things change on a daily basis, so trying to keep these graphs and, and numbers up to date has been pretty difficult, but the trends are there. Uh, so the good news is, as we mentioned, China, uh, the new uh, the new cases are increasing less than 0.5% per day. In fact, that's even on further decline. Uh, South Korea has seen a massive decline, so they quite uh, did a quite a good job of flattening the curve, as well as uh, Singapore and Japan. So there is hope out there that countries can do that, and that's certainly what uh, Canada is trying to achieve at this point in the in the infections. The bad news is it continues to grow uh, in some areas. Of course, the most significantly being Italy and Iran has been growing um, at an incredible rate. Uh, like 80,000 80, there combined. Actually, that's much higher as of today. I think uh, Italy's at 60,000 alone. Um, Spain, France, Germany, and the US are reporting about 30,000 each. Again, that's uh, a couple of days ago. The U.S. has just broached through 50,000, uh, and Spain, I, I believe, is about 40,000 now, 45,000. Germany seems to slow down. They're still around the 30K, uh, but we're seeing it uh, starting to spread dramatically in some of these areas. The financial markets, uh, we're going to dive into a lot more, but it's in full panic mode. There is no... Um, there is no sense of people buying quality or, or, or selling 
non-quality uh, to buy quality, it is uh, pure selling. Uh, and what, to, of course, the markets are simply um, supply and demand. So the more people selling, less people buying, the markets are going to continue to to go down. We do have updates. Today's been a, a solid uh, recovery day, uh, but don't expect that to last because we have not answered those three questions that I mentioned earlier as to give some certainty to the markets going forward. Um, the underappreciated element. So really what we have to look at here is uh, when is this going to end? There's obviously no uh, end date, but if we look at the graphs of, of other countries uh, and number of days it's taken to get past that peak, if you will, it's, uh, it's about 40 days, uh, give or take, of course, uh, based on the quality of numbers. And we can only work on numbers that, uh, that we have. Uh, and every country is different. Uh, Italy is going to be a fairly good uh, test subject, um, given that they have universal healthcare um, mass um, uh, testing and uh, fairly open with their data. Uh, China, there's some question on the quality of their data, but uh, certainly we can see a trend. Uh, and the US, of course, we're quite late with their testing, so it's a difficult one to gauge uh, as it starts to ramp up now. Uh, they are uh, starting to see 35 to 50% uh, increase in cases per day uh, as the testing increases. So when we talk about flattening the curve, uh, what's important here, and, and, and this is approaching kind of our lifestyles, not so much the market, but uh, it's, I, I believe it's the same approach to both. So uh, you've probably seen this in the news. You've probably seen people talk about it. I, I'm just going to touch on it. Uh, effectively, this is the infection rate, um, not number of people infected, and I think that's a bit of the, the misconception, is there's a bit of panic out there saying, you know, uh, if we don't do this, um, more and more people are going to be infected, and certainly it increases that odds, but really what we're talking about is uh, survival rates. Uh, by doing all these shutdowns, what countries are trying to do with the flattening of the curve is really just slow the impact on our healthcare system. So if you look at the red graph, the bell graph, which is what we've seen in Italy, is uh, the, the infected rate, the number of people infected at one time overwhelms the healthcare system. And once the, the healthcare system is overwhelmed, you see an increase in mortality rates. Uh, so people who otherwise would have survived and, and recovered uh, are, are not. Uh, and, and if you look at Italy's numbers, they're about a 10% mortality rate higher than anywhere else in the world. And that's a few cultural uh, reasons, um, but also uh, just due to the healthcare system not able to give proper treatment to uh, those infected. And that also does not include those that may have other health um, issues that we would normally have had uh, and not be able to get care because the healthcare system is, uh, is overwhelmed. So the flattening of the curve through all these shutdowns, what we're trying to achieve or what the governments are trying to achieve is the blue curve. Uh, where uh, the number of affected doesn't change that much, uh, but what it does is slows the rate out, so uh, the, the death rates are much, much lower, um, and that's where you've seen the uh, anywhere from 1% to 2% around the world, where uh, people are able to get to the healthcare systems and are able to recover from the, uh, from the virus. And that's what we're, uh, the social distancing is, uh, is being pushed and these lockdowns are being pushed is to achieve that. It's really to help the healthcare system. And, uh, and on that, I would like to say to anyone who has any friends, family, uh, or even themselves working in the healthcare system or any of the vital uh, industries that uh, are out there keeping us, uh, keeping us supplied with food and, and the supply chains, uh, thank you and send my thanks to them because they don't get this partial vacation of uh, being at home. And, uh, and then, of course, there's those who are affected and uh, being laid off. Uh, so just a reminder, if anyone joined a little bit later, to, if you want to ask questions, it's the uh, question tab on your right. You can just type them in, and I'll see them pop up there. So let's talk about uh, the markets. Uh, nowhere to hide. Uh, the reason we say this is because unlike a normal recession, um, what we normally see in a recession is certain areas in the market, certain sectors of the market uh, suffer more than others. 
A uh, good example of this is our portfolios. Uh, in October last year, we took them more conservative, uh, specifically expecting a recession in 2020. Uh, and so we shifted to cash. And as always in these types of downturns, cash is king. So our portfolios are sitting anywhere between 30 and 35% in cash, which allows us to go uh, buying uh, uh, for opportunity. As the as the market uh, flattens and uh, and recovers, um, but uh, the, and also we shifted the portfolios to what we call more uh, resilient stocks uh, during a recession period. So that just means moving away from community, uh, the discretionary type of items, move away from things like restaurants and travel. Thank goodness we didn't have any exposures there, and moving into things like grocery stores and utility companies like electrical power uh, but what we're seeing uh, during all this is uh, all sectors being hit so those quality companies are being affected uh, and they are dropping uh, we do see up days not every day is down we've seen record up days in, in, in fact a couple of weeks ago we saw a record gain day um, it followed a couple of days by a record fall day so it is back and forth uh, it is very difficult to try to trade in I don't necessarily recommend people try to trade into this. We are not through this quite yet. Uh, here's some uh, historic numbers of drops and then gains. So we're not worried about this panic. It is panic. It's, this is not a sell-off due to lack of quality. This is just people selling for the sake of selling. It's never an effective uh, portfolio strategy to do that. Uh, because there's always a recovery. Whenever we look at uh, historical events, uh, the recovery period is generally uh, much stronger and, and, and higher uh, 12 months after the, uh, the downturn. And if you miss out on those gains, uh, that's when your portfolio really suffers. That doesn't mean not doing anything. Uh, certainly, we have to look at every position within the portfolio to decide uh, which ones are going to be the best to recover and which ones are, are managing the best during this downturn. And again, previous uh, bear markets, how quick to recovery, uh, how long it will take from uh, peak to trough, and then how long it takes, how many days it takes to recover. I do believe this will be a fast recovery once uh, we get the market stabilized uh, because there are those quality, quality companies out there that uh, are not losing money, they are not being impacted, uh, and they continue to operate. And we'll talk a bit more about that in, in the third part here. Why we tell people not to panic and not to necessarily sell during these periods. Uh, this is the graph that comes up in every downturn, uh, and it is a very powerful one and, and very impactful. Uh, and it just shows how the rate of return of your portfolio can be affected if you miss uh, just a few days of those up days. So, you know, this is just showing you um, this would be 500, the broad index, uh, that, you know, if you missed, uh, you know, just 10 days of uh, 10 of the best days during that, uh, that time period, you could uh, underperform by 2 or 3 percent versus the 11 percent that the market uh, market performs. And you never know when those days are going to come. So if you own quality, I suggest you stick with it and, and wait out those days because the better quality you have, the faster it is going to rebound into the market uh, rallies uh, as opposed to, um, you know, some things will take longer. And uh, that's why uh, analyzing your portfolio is really important. So the current economic uncertainty around the COVID, um, you know, Canadian equities, this is going to put us into a recession. It's going to put most of the world into a recession. That's not surprising. Um, as I said, we were kind of expecting it anyway. Uh, there was a lot of things going on around the world uh, that has not changed. Uh, small and mid-cap stocks or small and medium-sized companies uh, will be affected more. One thing to really keep in mind when you're looking at quality of your, of your companies is not necessarily uh, the type of business they're in. Uh, or uh, whether they're closed or not closed is debt. So small and mid-sized companies are going to have a much harder time refinancing debt. Uh, and that just means um, if they have some debt come and due, uh, the sooner it's come and due, the more risk they are. And that, if you can just imagine someone who's 
uh, had a mortgage and they paid their mortgage, uh, you know, every every week, every month, without any problem. And all of a sudden, you know, both uh, both individuals are laid off amid all this, and then their mortgage comes due uh, next month. Uh, it's going to be very hard for them to find that financing. Uh, that's the same with companies. Uh, companies that do uh, very strongly, they have great cash flows. Doesn't matter um, how long they've been paying that. If that debt comes due in a period like this, they cannot go to the market to raise capital because it'd be way too expensive for them to do so. Uh, and they can't go to lenders because lenders are already scrambling for liquidity. So um, those are things to really keep in mind uh, in these types of markets is to really look for companies who have strong balance sheets and their debt is financed over a longer period of time. Um, and uh, and they have uh, deep lines of credit, so they haven't that are already proved that they haven't tapped into yet. So that's uh, when you're looking for value, keep that in mind. Uh, in 2008, we saw a lot of companies get taken out, not because of the health of the business, but because of debt renewals that they had come and uh, come and do. Uh, so to talk a little bit more about where we see opportunities in this market. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we do see recoveries after these. Uh, here's other similar ones with SARS, swine flu, Ebola, and Zika. Um, there's always been a, a very strong rally afterwards. Uh, again, generally because of that overselling due to panic as opposed to um, fundamentals. I do recommend to people to be careful about trying to pick the one-off stock. I've had a lot of people talk about you know, what about this idea or I want to buy this one stock. Uh, and it's a great idea to, to look for new opportunities to add to your portfolio, to your diversification, but do not take the risk on a single name uh, because anything can happen. As I said, there's those debts uh, that might become a due if you're not aware of, uh, that might affect it. Uh, we still have things going on between the US and Iran, which is not getting better. Iran has already been asking for the sanctions to be lifted to help them recover from this. Um, trade tensions have not gone away, uh, and this back and forth between the what to name this uh, or who's to blame for the virus has gone back and forth between China and the U.S. Uh, so that has not gone away and will come back to light again after uh, we come out of this. And then, of course, we still have the U.S. election uh, to deal with, uh, and there's still a lot of back and forth uh, and uncertainty around that. So diversification and keeping the fundamentals of, of the economics in mind is really important when we uh, decide to move back into the market and, and when to move back into the market. The uh, so one thing to keep in mind is also dividend yield. Uh, so what we're seeing right now is a, not unprecedented, but uh, not since 2010 have we seen uh, the uh, yield so high in, in companies. So of course, you know, as the company gets cheaper, the the dollar value or the percentage that they're paying goes goes up. We're seeing banks range between six and eight percent dividend right now. We have not seen that in a long time. Uh, and and many other companies, especially utility companies, uh, we've seen an increase. Again, this goes back to debt and underlying economics. Can they maintain that dividend? Some companies will use a period uh, like this to uh, cut their dividend and apply that money uh, elsewhere, whether it's to uh, secure the balance sheet, whether it's to do an expansion, uh, or whether it's to cover costs uh, during the down period that they had to outlay, whether that's from uh, having to shut down or pay employees. Uh, so really looking at the dividend closely, uh, this will be a very uh, key area to invest in when going back, because strong dividends uh, are, are are great for investments uh, if you can get paid six to seven percent while you hold uh, and you don't need to sell the capital uh, you can be very patient for the stock to come back uh, the banks do represent a, a very good value they have not uh, or sorry they did not cut their dividend through the 0809 crisis uh, so that bodes well sorry the Canadian banks did not uh, so that bodes quite well for uh, a, a potential investment into them uh, during this this crisis. That being said, there have been calls for some of the banks to cut the dividend to uh, maintain liquidity, uh, but that's been mostly on the international front. Uh, we've seen it out of a couple of banks in Europe and a couple of uh, the, the U.S. banks, and those uh, those uh, entities did cut dividends during the 08-09 crisis. 
So uh, we'll keep an eye on that. Again, I don't think it's time to jump back in the market quite yet, but uh, the Canadian banks uh, do look like a stronger a stronger opportunity. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind in, uh, in the portfolio, as I mentioned, we do have grocery stores uh, and power companies. Um, they are not losing revenue. In fact, if, if uh, you go to your local grocery store these days, it's busier than ever. And of course, empty shelves. Uh, so they're boating quite well through that. So those are good values. Uh, some names there, you know, Loblaws being a big name, uh, that's your superstores. And then of course, Alma Kustard, which is one that we've always uh, had for quite some time. And that's uh, Eastern Canada or the East part of Canada from Ontario over. Um, both really good values and strong dividend payers. Um, you know, on the power company front, um, uh, Algonquin Power out of Ontario and um, Fortis uh, in the West, uh, both strong uh, investments uh, for the, from that front. Um, uh, Ontario has announced that they're going to cut hydro costs during the crisis, but that should not affect their profitability uh, or their ability to uh, pay dividends uh, in, the, in the longer run. They, uh, they have that room, so I wouldn't be too worried there. But those are things to keep in mind uh, for the portfolios. You know, other areas to look at that we already have in the portfolios, we have Johnson & Johnson, Procter & Gamble, of course, supply all your soaps and tissue and, and, and uh, paper products. Uh, 3M, which makes all the medical masks, gloves, and, and, and suits. Uh, there, there's a lot of uh, strong areas to look at. I've had people question about Amazon. Of course, people uh, purchasing online and not going out. My more favorite play, which we already have in the portfolio, is a Visa and MasterCard. Uh, as I always remind people, they do not own any debt. Their revenue is strictly from when you tap or swipe. Uh, they collect a fee. Uh, and as more people are, uh, are shopping online, and even in stores, you'll, you'll notice that a lot of them aren't taking cash right now for the, uh, from, from the spread uh, of the, the virus standpoint. So those two companies, even though they've come off their highs, are still uh, amazing companies to own. And I recommend them in any portfolio. Uh, and we might look at added more. So the big question is when when to add more. And, and this is, again, is a very familiar graph that comes up during many uh, downturns um, where, uh, and we'll t ignore the, the, the blue ones, which is the, the euphoria, and we're, where were we on that line uh, going into this crisis? Um, it's hard to tell uh, because we've kind of artificially created a, uh, a recession or, or accelerated the recession with the, uh, with the virus. But what we're really seeing is the, the yellow dots there. We're, we're seeing the anxiety and the fear and the panic. Uh, that's where we're seeing the selling. Despondency is when people give up and stop selling. They just say, uh, it's too low to sell. It's sometimes called capitulation. They just say, that's it. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to sell anymore. Uh, I will caution people to get caught up on today, days like today where we're seeing a rally. Uh, it's been ranged between 8 and 9% on the upside today. Uh, for the Canadian markets and similarly in the U.S. markets. Um, they're often called what we call a dead cat bounce or a false rally. And that's where the sellers slow down, so the panic starts to ease off a little bit and the buyers start to jump in thinking it's over. Uh, so we'll see the big jumps up because the buyers are outweighing the sellers. But what ends up happening very, very often and multiple times in these kinds of uh, corrections is the sellers see the, the price go up a bit, and then they start to panic again, saying, oh, it's, it's high enough, I can start selling again, and then we see the, the, the downturn. Really, we have to get through those first three things. So we need clarity on the, the government assistance programs. We need clarity on uh, the viruses uh, projection, uh, projected, and clarity on what comes next as far as the treatments and cures go. Uh, we probably won't see that clarity uh, for at least uh, another month or two. The big one outstanding, uh, and this goes a little bit to uh, my opinion and our analysts' opinions, is we have to see the U.S.'s numbers uh, start to stabilize. Because the U.S. is the outlier here in two factors. One, it's a big population and it's a big economy. So if we see the U.S. 
a start to model after Italy, which is call it your worst case scenario, then we're not through the worst of this yet. Um, if we see the US flatten the curve uh, somehow um, or skirt the curve a bit, uh, then we could be getting close to the end of it. Because of the size of the economy, uh, the markets will react dependent on how the US come, uh, progresses here. The curve is starting to sharpen. It's not in the Italy mode yet, but it's certainly not flattened yet. So it's going to take a bit more time before we see that despondency in the market or that capitulation in the market where the panic buyer sellers rather are out and then we can start buying on quality. No one's ever going to pick the exact bottom. That's not, so that's not this exercise. Uh, it's to buy really good quality at a really good value. And that opportunity is actually going to open up here. Probably one of the best uh, we've seen in, um, in a generation as far as uh, value to quality that's going to open up as far as uh, the portfolio's opportunities. So we do see that. We don't see it for uh, several more weeks uh, to possibly two months. Again, we'll be closely watching uh, the U.S. curve to, to see how they go. Canada's curve uh, is actually looking quite strong. Um, we're not accelerating at the same pace as the U.S. or Italy. Uh, we haven't quite got to the point that we could say we're going to be a Japan or South Korea, uh, but it is looking better in Canada than, uh, than some countries, uh, and we hope that that can continue. And uh, really, from a market perspective, and from a home perspective, it's really going to come down to people keeping a level head and and, and being realistic about uh, being cautious about the spread and keeping our healthcare system uh, working and operating uh, in an efficient manner. So that's where uh, we are as far as the market cycles go. So how long? So everyone wants to know when this is uh, when the turnaround uh, and how long it's going to take. Really, it's difficult to tell. Uh, generally, we start to see the bounce back in the markets, and I've been telling clients this, anywhere from four to six months. Like I said, I do expect for the quality uh, in company, and maybe not indexes, you know, the news talk about indexes, um, not necessarily indexes, but the quality companies within those indexes, four to six months after the crisis. And it won't be over, but it will be, uh, we'll be at the, the tail end of the curves. We'll, we'll start to see the recoveries outpace the infection, infected rate and the, uh, the number of deaths ease off. And so we, when our healthcare systems are handling the volumes, uh, we'll start to see uh, things lighten up in the markets and we'll uh, anywhere from four to six months after that, we should see a strong rebound uh, in those quality companies that have been able to continue to um, uh, Plod through that. Some companies are going to have a much longer recovery. Uh, I've had a few people ask me about the airlines, um, whether uh, they're going to be, or cruise ship companies, whether they're going to be a good buy. I would not, I'm generally, so I'll, I'll caveat this, I'm not an airline fan to begin with. I think Warren Buffett said it best that if you put the whole industry together since Kitty Hawk, it has never made money. Um, so I'm not an airline buyer in general, but um, I, I would not see those as good or quick recovery buys for a lot of reasons. One, uh, even if we recover from this, what is the population going to uh, act uh, as far, how are they going to act as far as travel? Are they going to jump back on it? Are they going to be very cautious? And the same goes with the cruise lines um, or anything tourist related. Uh, and then also you have to remember the model uh, with uh, airlines is they own zero assets. So all those planes are all leased. So uh, they operate purely on cash flow. So if you turn off, ca turn off cash flow and all you're left is with lease, which is considered debt, um, it's very easy for them to go into restructuring or bankruptcy restructuring in Canada, CCAA and the US Chapter 11. Uh, and almost all the airlines we have out there today have been through restructuring in the past. And all that means is the debt holders come out with slightly less money uh, but own more of the company and the shareholders get nothing. So I, I would not be looking at those. I do expect there to be, uh, there to be restrictions in those, in those industries uh, heavily, uh, and I wouldn't recommend people uh, kind of uh, 
take a look at those as a speculative play. It would be a very long shot that you picked one that manage to avoid a restructuring. And there will be some that will, but um, it'll be very difficult um, in, in, the, in the entire travel industry, even if there is some sort of financial support from the governments uh, for, those, uh, for those companies, uh, it's very easy for them to restructure and come out the other side operating. So um, again, I'd be very cautious around um, anything like that. I would stick with your asset-based quality cash flow companies. Um, so again, as far as investment goes, if you have a plan and all our clients did, those who, who might not be with us on the call, um, stick, stick to your, stick to your plan. Don't change. That doesn't mean not doing anything. Uh, we are making changes in the portfolios. We're removing anything from the portfolio that we think isn't going to be a fast recover. And we're going to redistribute that cash to areas where we think is going to be a fast recovery. Uh, and we'll make adjustments as we go through this, as the story unfolds. Um, so it doesn't mean not doing anything, but sticking to the plan is very important. Um, trying to panic out and get back in uh, is very, very difficult. And uh, usually uh, at the losing end, um, to be that lucky is almost impossible. So uh, I'm not going to go into the, this, but about Canaccord, of course, we're operating, as I mentioned, uh, we have full remote services. Our offices are open. They are uh, on skeleton staff. Uh, my team are all working from home. Uh, we're fully accessible as normal. Uh, we do have this new um, platform that we're working with. Uh, so we are going to do more updates along the way to uh, keep everyone informed but also uh, we have the ability to do one-on-one -on -one meetings by this way, through this. Um, and, uh, and of course, we're always available for, for phone conversations or email. So uh, do feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Uh, all our research desk and um, analysts and strategists are working and putting out material on hourly basis, uh, if not uh, daily. Uh, we're, we're getting uh, updates constantly from around the world from our law offices, and that will continue, and uh, we'll keep you all apprised. Um, as far as questions, are there any questions? Let me just go through here. We've got a few that have come through as I've been going on and on. Um, uh, one question here is about the, the stock market and oil pricing. Uh, of course, yes, uh, I didn't touch that on the pres presentation, but we have seen oil plummet to nearly $20 or just below 20 in midday trading. Um, and uh, it's been great to see that at the pump. Uh, that's mainly been through a price war between uh, Russia and Saudi Arabia uh, as they battle to continue revenues and offset the cost of this virus. Um, the, uh, we do see oil recovering. In fact, prior to this, um, when we were predicting a recession, one of the areas we, we thought was a good value for Canada was oil. We still see that. However, we do have to get through this price war. That will end as uh, the economies return back to normal. This does not bode well for Russia or Saudi Arabia to keep prices at this level. Uh, they might be able to afford it for a short period of time, but uh, long term, that's not a, economically viable. Uh, so we, uh, we will uh, keep an eye on that, but we don't feel that that's going to be one of your uh, fast recovering. Uh, areas of the market. So I would not be uh, a value buyer there. You might be what we call chasing value where it continues to fall. So uh, it will be something we would come back to after we got some stability, but not quite yet. Uh, another question, uh, low rates, um, are you talking about interest rates. Uh, uh, oh, the question is uh, worthwhile to take out a loan at this point to invest in markets top up and uh, TFSAs and so forth. So as I said, cash is king. Um, I, I do recommend anyone who is withdrawing money from their investments or has money uh, parked uh, aside that they, they don't think that they'll need uh, to consider placing that when the time is right uh, into the markets or taking it and topping up their savings. It is uh, it is an unprecedented level to, to get in that. As far as loans go, let's talk about rates first. So interest rates in the US have had two major cuts. They're almost at zero. Uh, now, the banks aren't given zero. That's just the government right to the banks. Um, Canada's done one cut. Uh, we are expecting Canada to follow a second cut 
Uh, however, we have not seen that yet. Um, it is tempting to look at a, a leverage play to borrow at such low rates and invest in the market. However, I've always been one to be very, very cautious when, uh, when using leverage. Uh, because uh, if it does last longer, you do have to service that loan or service the interest. Uh, it really comes down to your personal situation, whether that cash flow uh, or service in that loan uh, fits into your normal cash flow, that it doesn't impede your lifestyle or put you at risk. Uh, obviously, if you're limited on cash flow or your cash flow uh, extra uh, demand on your cash flow, uh, leverage is not uh, or leverage will put extra demand in your cash flow leverage is not uh, a strategy I would necessarily recommend for you uh, just simply because it does add added risk that you might not want to have um, I, I would much rather look at other alternatives within the port your portfolio or financial picture to uh, take advantage of these prices um, other questions here uh, is gold a good opportunity um, normally, I would say yes, uh, and, and by that I just mean by the general rules of, of, of finance and hedging, hedging, gold tends to, or traditionally, has gone up when markets go down uh, as people look for safety and currency hedges. Uh, that has not happened uh, this time, and it did not happen in 08, 09. And in fact, what we're seeing uh, during this period of time is gold, uh, it's gone up and down a little bit. Um, it has not really gained. Uh, I'd say it's net negative through this, um, or slightly negative, but certainly not market negative. Um, but uh, what we saw in 08, 09, and we're certainly seeing now is the, uh, the US dollar rally. And we saw that in 08, 09, where the world, not just Americans, uh, saw the US currency as the safest place to park. Um, we're seeing that again. So um, I don't think gold is going to hurt you badly, but I don't think you're going to see a big jump or, or the protection you're looking for in, in gold uh, in, this, uh, in this current market as, as we might have seen in historic uh, trends uh, and, and the last downturn, we saw the same, the same uh, lack of correlation in, in that as well. Uh, I'll do one more question here. Let me just go through um, uh, what kind of asset allocation uh, would you recommend during the period uh, to play defensively? Uh, well, again, you know, this goes back to uh, what I was mentioning, uh, really looking in your portfolio for quality. Uh, stick into your, your asset allocation that is, that is suited for your goals. Um, it is vital during these periods, not panicking and, and switching. Making a change at this point uh, you know, some people might have a more aggressive or what we call a growth strategy, and then we'll want to, um, you know, get a little uh, gun shy here and, and go more conservative. Uh, I would not say now is the time to do it. Uh, those are those types of changes are uh, really geared towards um, the times in the market when you're up. You can you can shift. I would wait it out and stick to your strategy. The individual positions within there, of course, have to be analyzed to make sure they're the right ones. Uh, but I would stick with a growth strategy uh, through this until recovery happens and then reanalyze your situation for uh, next downturn uh, to make sure that you don't, uh, you don't put yourself under undue stress. Uh, those who are conservative who are thinking about growing growth, again, it would be individually based. Uh, we'd have to uh, really go through and say, is that the right thing to do? Um, uh, it could be uh, if you've got that room and time horizons uh, to, to to step things up a little bit and um, take advantage of these these uh, lower uh, price in, in the markets. Um, so uh, so hopefully that answered a lot of questions and, and kind of gave people a good picture of what's going on. Uh, I am going to do more of these uh, going forward to, uh, as things unfold. Uh, so please stay tuned. Uh, look at your emails. We're going to try to keep everyone up to date. And by all means, uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out on a one-to-one -one basis. We're, uh, we're happy to answer them. Uh, with that, I will let you all go. Uh, 45 minutes, it's right where we were hoping to time it. And uh, keep everyone uh, informed. You guys take care, stay safe, and uh, enjoy maybe some quiet time. Thank you.